Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Saba, and today we're investigating a simple yet foundational concept in corporate finance and investment management, which is how to determine the cost of equity or required rate of return or expected return on a company's stocks. And today we're investigating two go-to techniques that are heavily used in academia and in the industry, which are the dividend discount model or the Gordon growth model, as well as the capital asset pricing model or CAPA. And we would apply them to one of the most famous established and stable stocks on the American market, which is Caterpillar. And today we'll first investigate the Gordon's growth model implications for cost of equity calculations. Uh, Gordon growth model is also known as the dividend discount model. We've got a separate video on the use of Gordon growth model for stock valuation. But actually, there is a very nice mathematical twist you can um, use in case of the dividend discount model to figure out the cost of equity. The major equation that you might be familiar with in terms of the Gordon growth model is the following. The price of the stock or its fair value, the fundamentally justified amount that you'll be willing to pay for a stock, is nothing less than a present value of a stream of future dividends. And as companies at least expected to intend to function until perpetuity, we value it as a growing perpetuity with some growth rate of dividends. And this can be most commonly estimated using historical data. We extrapolate past dividend growth into the future. And if we use the mathematics of geometric series, we will be able to derive this uh, quite concise formula. However, if we are willing to estimate not the fair value, knowing some required rate of return or discount rate R, which is specific to this uh, stock's level of risk, we would uh, be uh, needing to rearrange the formula to figure out R, or cost of equity. Again, in finance, uh, corporate finance and investment management, uh, the terms cost of equity, required rate of return, expected return, they are interchangeable in terms of the concept, but the main difference is from which perspective are you looking at the particular phenomenon. If you are looking from the investor side, then it is a required rate of return. That's how much of a growth rate in terms of your investment would you be requiring, would you be demanding to accept the given level of risk. For the company, from the internal perspective, it is cost of equity, how costly it is to attract capital via equity financing. And if you're quite impartial, if you're an econometrician, for example, or a researcher, you would just call it expected return. Today, we're approaching it from the internal corporate perspective, so it's indeed cost of equity, denoted K subscript E for equity. And given this rearrangement, we'll be able to figure out what the cost of equity is uh, from the logic of the dividend discount model. We'll need to know the most recent dividend D0 or D0, the historical growth rate or some extrapolated calculated growth rate of dividends G per annum, as well as the most recent stock price B. So here we have got a stream of quarterly dividends. Again, most US companies pay dividends quarterly, most UK companies pay dividends semi-annually, and you can easily extract it from Yahoo Finance. And we'll be able to calculate dividends per share, just summing up dividends that are attributable to a particular year without taking too much time. Obviously, if you've got loads of the, those calculations to make, you can easily automate that using something like some if. But here, as our task is pretty simple and short, you could do it manually and um, in the most um, straightforward way possible. So we know that the most recent dividend that we received in 2021 is $4.28 per share. But how fast have dividends grown over the years? Well, to figure out the annual um, 
compounded average uh, dividend growth, we can simply divide the dividend that we received in 2021 by the dividend that we received in 2017, raise it to the power of 1 over 4, as 4 years have passed since year-end 2017 until year-end 2021. Again, bear in mind, we're performing this valuation, we're performing this calculation as of year-end 2021 for our simplicity, and subtracting 1 to get the growth rate and not the rate of appreciation, giving us the annual dividend growth rate of 8.4%. Then, to take into account the scaling of dividends, the dividend that we will be next uh, expected to pay from the company's perspective, dividends that you pay, an increasing amount of those, in that fact, are costs that equity financing uh, is associated with. So we'll need to scale the most recent dividend by 1 plus the estimated growth rate to figure out the future dividend of $4.64 uh, per share. The most recent stock price can be looked up over here. That's the stock price uh, at the year end of 2021, uh, $206.08. And then we are ready to figure out the cost of equity as per the Gordon Growth or Dividend Discount model. To do that, we'll simply need to divide the future dividend onto the stock price and add the dividend growth rate as per this particular formula resulting in a cost of equity estimation of 10.65%, which is, um, all in all, quite a realistic and reasonable figure to report. However, this is not the only, and perhaps not even the most famously applied, technique of estimating cost of equity. And another one that we'll cover today is capital asset pricing model, or CAPM. The notion of CAPM is that uh, the required rate of return, or cost of equity, results from and only from the systematic market risk sensitivities to the overall market movements that a particular stock entails the holder to. So to figure out the cost of equity, we necessarily need to figure out how much the market at large pays for bearing market risk and also how sensitive the share price movements of Caterpillar are to the movements of the market at large. To do that, we have got five years worth of daily stock price data for Caterpillar and S&P 500. Again, this is the most reasonable market benchmark to choose for Caterpillar. Again, a large cap uh, American corporation. For a UK corporation, choose something like FTSE 100 or FTSE 250. And we can easily calculate daily returns by dividing the price today by the price yesterday and subtracting one. Uh, applying that for both Caterpillar and S&P 500 and enforcing it throughout our five-year sample. What we need to also keep in mind is what is the risk-free rate, the rate of return that you can get uh, reliably without uh, taking on any risk at all. And this most commonly is assumed to be the yield to maturity of a government bond. Again, uh, governments of uh, developed markets such as the US and the UK are virtually uh, default risk-free. So if you select a government bond of a maturity that's comparable to your investment horizon and hold a government bond until maturity, you'll reliably, without any risk at all, get the yield that's currently quoted. Bear in mind that you need to select the maturity that corresponds to investment horizon. So this is one of the assumptions of CAPM that all investors have the same investment horizons. Uh, again, one of the uh, several quite unrealistic assumptions. However, empirically, this model works um, quite well, especially given the assumptions of it are, again, quite unrealistic. So here we'll select the 10-year uh, government bond yield. That's quite uh, common to assume that you take 10-year yields for the risk rate proxy, and that has been equal to 1.51% at the time. And now we need to figure out the beta, the sensitivity, of Caterpillar uh, stock returns to S&P 500 stock returns. To do it uh, fast and efficiently, we can use the slope function, um, estimating the slope of Caterpillar returns onto S&P 500 returns, selecting these two columns here, and get a slope of 1.11, meaning that Caterpillar uh, returns are uh, quite sensitive to the movements of the market, and that the Caterpillar stock is a little bit more risky, a little bit uh, more volatile in terms of systematic risk than the market at large because the beta coefficient is greater than one 
again, the market beta is by definition one because the market moves in unison with itself. If a beta is quite high, then the stock is quite risky. So greater than one means more systematic risk than the market. Less than one means less risk. So quite straightforward. And again, uh, in the logic of Kappen, the greater the beta, the greater the systematic risk exposure, the greater is the required return, the expected return, or from the perspective of the company itself, the cost of its equity. So here, the final uh, step that we need to take before we can estimate the cost of equity, according to Kappen, is to figure out what the market return has been over the past five years. To do that, we need to divide the last um, value of the S&P 500 index in 2021 by the last value of it in 2016. Here, as five years have passed since year-end 2016 until year-end 2021, we need to raise it to the power of 1 over 5 and subtract 1, giving us the market return of 16.37%. Then, we need to figure out how much the market has paid in excess of the risk-free uh, alternative, the government bond, resulting in the market risk premium of 14.86%. And finally, we assemble the formula. We add to the risk free rate the risk premium of the Caterpillar stock, which is beta, its uh, market risk exposure, its systematic risk, times the market risk premium. Figuring out how much does Caterpillar need to pay in excess of the risk free alternative given its systematic risk profile. And that's the whole idea behind the CAPM estimation which results in a cost of equity of 17.94%, which is quite a bit higher than the one we have estimated using the Gordon Growth Model or the Dividend Discount Model. Why such a um, difference? And uh, which of the models is more reliable? Well, that depends on a number of assumptions. First of all, for CAPM, uh, we do need to keep in mind that the market benchmark needs to be relevant for our stock. Here, that's fulfilled. Uh, Caterpillar is indeed coming from the S&P 500 itself, so there is no uh, better benchmark to take, really. Then we need to make sure that our beta, our slope, is properly estimated. And uh, here, as Caterpillar is quite a liquid stock, uh, taking daily returns is warranted. If you were to estimate the beta for a less liquid stock, you would probably need to take it at a lower frequency, for example, weekly or monthly, to estimate the beta more precisely, as there are lags in the speed of adjustment of uh, stock value to overall market movements if it's illiquid or small. And also, we need to keep in mind that this market return is historical over the past five years. Does it mean that over the next year or the next five years, the market risk premium would be exactly equal to its uh, historical value? Well, not necessarily, but the longer time periods you take here, the uh, more precise this estimation of uh, market risk premium from historical data is. You could use alternative uh, measures of market risk premium using, for example, values implied by derivatives contracts, such as index futures contracts. But again, in practice, uh, this is uh, the most, um, the simplest and the most uh, commonly resorted to uh, alternative. In terms of the assumptions of the dividend discount model, these are even more plentiful and more questionable. Uh, first of all, we need to um, assume that the historical dividend growth does continue into the future, that it's stable and justified by company's fundamentals, that Caterpillar can grow its dividends by 8% per annum uh, for uh, eternity. Again, the dividend growth of 8% is on the higher end of plausible, but still nothing too unrealistic. And we also uh, need to keep in mind that the dividend discount model is applicable only to the companies that reliably pay dividends. Stocks that do not pay dividends, well, this one is unapplicable to them. And if you're interested in more criticism and uh, uh, investigation of the assumptions of the dividend discount model, please check the video series that we've got on it uh, previously. And that's all there is for the application of Golden Growth Model, the dividend discount model, or the Capital Asset Pricing Model, CAPA, for the evaluation of cost of equity. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.